Welcome to the Downcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. So back in May, I was in the Fantastic Strand Bookshop on Broadway in New York and descended into the bowels of the basement where they hide the aviation books. And I found the most wonderful book by Keith O'Brien called Fly Girls. And it was a lovely signed first edition as well. The book tells a tale of an incredible group of women in America in the 1920s and 30s who were pushing forward women in aviation to the nth degree. Now, this group would have a huge effect on the women that came beyond them. The organization that they founded called the 99s still exists today. We're going to be looking at a few of the women that Keith looks at in Fly Girls. Ruth Nichols, who became a movie star in the silent era. Amelia Earhart, who stands head and shoulders above almost all aviation topics. Everybody knows who she is. And the fantastic Louise Thaden, who personally, I think, needs more love, which is why we're going to be doing a podcast talking a lot about her and her friends who fought very hard to race in the men's races that culminated in a famous victory in the 1936 Bendix Trophy. It's only logical to start at the beginning and ask Keith where his journey for this book began and how he started to delve into the story that became Fly Girls. Yeah, I guess I want to be clear, you know, to to your listeners, you know, this is... Um... This is not a sort of textbook look at female uh, pilots at the dawn of aviation, Um, the sort of textbook uh, where each woman would have her own chapter. Uh, If you were going to do that kind of book, you would have needed like 25 or 30 different chapters. As you know, Mm -hmm. there were so many compelling, important um, characters in the 1920s and 30s flying airplanes, building airplanes, male and female. What I really wanted to do here was focus in on on a group of women, uh, a small cohort of women who knew each other, who flew with and against each other, and in doing so changed the world. And so, you know, as I started to think about my project in that way, I really just started to think about, well, who were the women pilots who, who moved the story forward between 1927 and 1936, this little window of time where my story takes place. And when you start to think about it that way, it gets much easier. Uh, you know, I, clearly Amelia Earhart is a fundamental character and in, in in protagonist in that story. Uh, clearly, in my mind, Louise Thaden was as well. You know, Louise is going to win the first all-female airplane race in 1929, the, the so-called Powder Puff Derby. And then she's going to win the Bendix in 1936. So that's, she's clearly very important. And then, you know, with, with Amelia and Louise in mind, uh, I really looked again to what other flights or, or pilots really moved the story. And, you know, Ruth Nichols was clearly important. You know, she's widely forgotten. Uh, but, but in the early 1930s, before uh, Amelia's first solo flight alone, over over the Atlantic in 1932, uh, Ruth Nichols has eclipsed uh, Amelia in almost every fundamental way. Uh, and then uh, Ruth Elder and Florence Klingensmith, the other two main protagonists in my book, also make bold and daring flights uh, that that change everything, both for women in the air on the ground. So when you look at the story in that way, uh, it was easier to figure out who to focus in on, because that's one thing that any author uh, has to decide early on. Any any nonfiction author is who are the, the the main protagonists I can I can focus on here. Who are the people through which I can tell this story? If if you fail to sort of winnow it down, if you fail to focus in on just a couple of key people, your story becomes less human. It becomes, you know, more academic, more boring, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, completely. And I think that's the thing that sort of drew me to it was that it was a, I don't want to say narrative history. It was a, it was a story that you told through so many different eyes at the same time. So it was, you know, the next sort of bit that we were going to talk about was really just how do you not make it just about Amelia Earhart? Because she just you just say the name and everybody knows who Amelia Earhart is. But as you said, some of these other women who had phenomenal careers, and you know, we're we're going to chat about a few of them. How, how do how do you make sure that you're 
sort of pulling focus on others and not just getting lost in that one incredible tale that, you know, so much has already been written about. Surely that was yeah. the easy path. Just talk about Amelia Earhart and throw a few other people in. You're right. It, it, easy in a lot of ways, too, because, you know, uh, Amelia Earhart's uh, personal archives are voluminous, uh, you know, mm. because she was so famous, uh, you know, uh, she has uh, massive archives at two different universities here in the United States. Uh, you know, she, she has a major holdings of her papers at, at a library at Harvard University in Boston. And she has a second major holdings uh, at Purdue University in Indiana. So, you know, one of the challenges, of course, for me was finding enough primary source material. And by that, I mean diaries, flight logs, letters, memos, telegrams, etc., uh, things written in, in the, the hand of these women said in their words to, to bring them back to life on the page. So, so it would have been easy to focus on Amelia, except from the outset for me, it, it, was, it was more than that. You know, I guess I, in order to explain that, I probably need to tell you sort of how I came to this story. Mm. I was uh, ironically of all places on an airplane in 2016 when I stumbled onto this story. I was, uh, I was flying from Boston uh, to Pittsburgh for a story I was doing at the time about the, uh, the presidential primaries that year. And I grabbed for that flight a book that had been sitting on my bedside stand for some time. Uh, it was uh, also a nonfiction book. Uh, it's called The Astronaut Wives Club. It's written by Lily Koppel. And it is narrative nonfiction uh, of the wives of the Mercury 7 astronauts. So, you know, I don't know about you, Matt, but one of my favorite books of all time is Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff. It's just Incredible so well-written. It's so compelling. It captures this moment in time. And, and Lily Koppel's book sort of told Tom Wolfe's story from the opposite perspective. She wanted to tell the same story of these people thrown into the cauldron of being astronauts um, in the early 1960s through the lens of their wives. And, and so, you know... I wanted to read it because I liked Tom Wolfe's book. And I also was reading it because I wanted to see how she did it, which is another thing that authors do. We read people's books to see, well, how did they write this book? How did they tell this story? And so I'm reading very closely. And, and very early in the book, there's just a, uh, some background p paragraphs about one of the wives, one of the Mercury 7 wives. And it mentioned that um, she was a, a licensed pilot who had longed to fly in an all-female airplane race that had started in the 1920s and that had once featured Amelia Earhart. And that was it. And it, it stopped me because, like a lot of people, I only knew that, that sort of Cliff Notes version of, Amelia, of Amelia's life. I just knew that story of her flying alone across the ocean in 1932. And, of course, I knew the story of her disappearance. I, I never knew of any kind of all-female airplane race in the 1920s. I never knew of Amelia racing anything. So I started to go down that rabbit hole. I started to look at that race. And of course, that race was the 1929 Powder Puff Derby, that first national uh, women's air race. And, and you know, I don't know what happens when you Google that now, but when you Googled it in 2016, um, you didn't find a lot. And, and all I really found was a Wikipedia page that listed uh, the, the 20 women who had participated in that race. And when I looked at that list of 20 women, I realized that I only knew two names. I knew Amelia, of course, and I knew Poncho Barnes. Um, and I knew Poncho because she is also a character in The Right Stuff. You know, she, by the 1960s, owns a bar where Neil Armstrong and Chuck Yeager and the others go and have drinks after flying their planes in the desert. And so I, I don't know 18 of these women, and I didn't know the winner of that race. And the winner of that race was Louise Thaden. And so that's where it started for me. And, and you know, I, I started to just, you know, spend time in libraries, reading, um, you know, newspaper coverage of that race. And one thing that I'm always looking for, or I guess three things that I'm always looking for, in, in a narrative nonfiction book, a story that could, could you know, carry an entire book, is I'm looking for characters you can root for and root against. I'm looking for uh, some kind of interesting world. 
and and then there needs to be an arc. You know, we need to start here and end here. And what was clear really from my very first trips to the library about um, this idea was that there was absolutely an interesting world. And now I just needed to find out, well, who are the characters? Who are the people to root for and root against? And, and where does it go from here? And when I started to look in it that way, it was clear to me that it was much bigger than an Amelia Earhart story. And it's amazing how those threads you sort of drew out took you on the journey you did. And, you know, Trudy Olson's fantastic in, in, in her own right as, you know, wife of my favourite Mercury 7 astronaut, Gordo Cooper. Um, <laughs> the most interesting couple in that whole story because their life was a mess. Go read that, dear listener. But we're not talking about her. Um, those races, and we're sort of going to jump around the, the running order of our notes, I hope you don't mind, because I think it's important that we just take a second to discuss what those national air races are, because people may have heard of Reno and, and the way the works course last year, of the races at Reno this year, but they were huge, weren't they? They were an event. What were the national air races in, in the 20s and the 30s? And of course, who was Cliff Henderson, the man who made them the thing that they were? So you're absolutely right. We, we, we really don't have any perspective on how big they really were. In this little window of time, again, from 1927 to 1936, the era that I'm writing about, um, you know, the, the three uh, most popular, uh, three or four most popular sports in America you know, was baseball, boxing, horse racing, and air racing. I mean, these events would draw over the course of a long weekend as many as a half million people to airfields a across America, you know, and I'm talking about that's the paying customer, people who could pay the quarter 50 cents a dollar to drive their car onto the airfield itself. Many more would watch, you know, from the floorboards and the truck beds of their vehicles parked on, on nearby roads and highways. So it was a massive deal. And, and, you know, it, it, it begins earlier than 1927, to be fair. I mean, frankly, just like the automobile, from the moment planes were invented and, and were proven capable of actually flying any, any distance whatsoever, people were racing them and trying to figure out who was faster. It's, it's the human uh, way. Um, but it was really in the late 1920s that these sort of informal races uh, uh, crystallized into something much more organized. And, and for me, the first modern air race, the first organized modern air race was, was 1928. It was, uh, and it was formed and organized by that man you mentioned a moment ago, Cliff Henderson. Cliff was uh, hardly a pilot. He had had some uh, flight training uh, during World War I and had flown uh, during World War I. But he came back to America, came back to California, and Cliff was a car salesman in Santa Monica. He was, a, uh, by all accounts, a very uh, charismatic one as well. Uh, he was a big thinker, a big talker, and a big dreamer. And uh, when plans were put forward to hold the national air races in Los Angeles in 1928, uh, Cliff applied for and received the job of organizing those air races. And Cliff chose as his, uh, as his airfield uh, a, a bean and barley field that was just south of downtown Los Angeles at the time. And of course, you know, we all know that bean and barley field today. That is LAX. Uh, and on that field, uh, Cliff staged about uh, over a week of races. Uh, featuring all the, the top pilots in America and, and the world, uh, including, of course, Charles Lindbergh. Um, and, and, you know, Amelia Earhart would fly in to be at those races. And uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth Nichols and, and, and Louise Thaden would also fly in to be at those races. Um, but they would not be part of those races. Uh, they were not invited to fly. But, but sitting there in the grandstand, uh, they realized that this was a, a, a massive missed opportunity um, that they absolutely need to, needed to um, claim for themselves in 1929. And, and that is exactly what they set out to do. Let's talk about some of those women, because we 
we're going to talk about Louise Thaden in, in, in a minute, but you've got Ruth Nichols. You've also got someone who just leaps off the page, mainly because of the career she goes on to have. And, and that's Ruth Elder as well, someone we, we've not mentioned, who not the most successful of pilots, but probably the one who channeled the notoriety into a quite impressive film career and, and things like that, because she makes one of the early attempts to cross the Atlantic as well, doesn't she? In the same way that Amelia Earhart would a, a few years later as essentially a passenger, but she's there as well. And she's a very interesting woman in her own right, because she's not that great a pilot, but she grabs this huge amount of attention at the same sort of time, doesn't she? She does. Uh, you know, Ruth Elder uh, really uh, deserves more credit than she receives. Um, for popularizing uh, aviation for women and girls in the late 1920s. Um, you know, obviously Lindbergh makes that historic flight across the Atlantic in May 1927. And it, and it sparks, you know, air fever, uh, air fever in America, air fever around the world. And here in America, he comes home. Lindbergh does with that famous plane of his, the Spirit of St. Louis. And he, he flies it across the country that summer, the summer of 1927. I believe it was like 92 cities and towns. He, he visits in his plane. And in every single city that he, he flies into, Lindbergh Day is, is celebrated uh, with massive crowds and parades. Parades that, by the way, Lindbergh himself did not like. He was bored with it all. Um, but in Air Fever... Uh, Ruth Elder, uh, who at the time was a receptionist at, at, a, at a dentist office in Lakeland, Florida, central rural Florida, it comes up with an idea. Uh, she has learned how to fly, not very well, as you said, but she does know how to fly. And she decides that she wants to be the first woman uh, to fly across the ocean. Uh, and, and she will attempt to make that flight uh, in October 1927, right about this time of year, actually. Uh, and uh, she will make it uh, with a with a co-pilot, a man who did have a lot of experience. And and it was just the two of them in this tiny little plane, uh, a Stinson Detroiter. I think it was about 40 feet across uh, the wings, uh, roughly 35 feet from tip to tail, a single engine plane, of course, top speed of about 105 miles an hour. And that plane had no radio. Um, and this was you know, the biggest uh, story of the fall of 1927. If Lindbergh had owned the spring and the summer of 1927 in America, Ruth Elder owned the fall. And that plane takes off from Roosevelt Field on Long Island in New York in October 1927. It was a red plane, and it had a, also a captivating name down the side of the fuselage in cursive lettering in bright yellow. It said, The American Girl. And, you know, of course, you know, she doesn't make it. We know that because, you know, six months later, uh, seven months later, Amelia Earhart will make her successful flight and will become, when she does, uh, the most famous woman in the world. But in her failure, Ruth Elder really does claim that mantle for that short period of time. I mean, she she makes headlines on on two continents, in Europe and in, and in North America. And, and is a, a, a massive star who also is participating in that Powder Puff Derby in that first all-women air race in August uh, 1929. So the Powder Puff, we're, we're calling it that, that wasn't its actual name, was it? That's just what the, the press gave it. And that's what, 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 what was the name of the race that, that Cliff had arranged for these women after much pressure put upon him to actually stage the race yeah it was it was the national uh women's air race you know it had a it had a it had a real name uh, a name that sounded official you know that term powder puff was denigrating and, and demeaning and insulting and it was it was given to the race by essentially an all-male press that was covering it uh, of course, it referred to, you know, the, the, the popular uh, makeup ap application item of, of the time. And it is fairly ironic to me and also sort of stunning. And I think a sign of just how big, culturally large this race was, that that term powder puff is still used today, um, you know, on college campuses for, you know, the, the women's 
you know, flag football league, you know, they called it, you know, powder puff football. Um, it, it was not, it was not a, uh, a compliment. It, it was an insult. And what kind of race was it? Cause you've got, in our minds, you've got the, the, the classic pylon racing that, that still goes on in various forms. Of course, uh, the, famously the Red Bull Air races sort of popularized that again over the last decade or so. But what sort of race was it? Cause it was, it was tricky, wasn't it? It was, yeah. it was not an easy, easy point to point dash. So yeah, there, there were two kinds of air races in the 1920s and thirties. There were the pylon races that was essentially like NASCAR in the sky, uh, where, uh, groups of planes would, would whip, whip their, uh, uh, groups of pilots would whip their planes around, uh, triangular courses framed by, you know, 50, 60 foot pylons that were, were built at an airfield or in a, in a town. And then there were the so-called derby races or, or free for alls. Um, and these were typically over much longer distances, typically transcontinental, um, you know, and in 1929, it was uh, it was nearly that uh, the women would be asked to fly from Santa Monica to Cleveland, and Cleveland was the home of the 1929 air races. So they would leave from Santa Monica and fly over the course of several days, point to point, uh, stopping in in multiple cities for overnight stays, and then their their overall time would be added up to determine uh, a, a winner. Um, and, you know, as your listeners will, will surely know, you know, flying a uh, single engine propeller open cockpit planes at this time was incredibly dangerous. It was it was dangerous if you were just doing it on the weekend for fun. It was certainly dangerous if you were doing it over an, over open terrain, uh, often maxing out the throttle in order to get there first. And and of course, uh, there there would be mishaps along the way, and there were a few, weren't there? Not not everyone who set off made it to the end, and and the, there there was a fatality, wasn't there? There was, um, like a lot of races in these days, there was a fatality. I mean, I it, it's stunning to go and live in in the archives of these races and relive these races through newspaper accounts and and whatnot, because nearly every time there was a, a major air race. There was usually a horrific crash along the way. Uh, and and I, it, it's, it's, it's hard to wrap your mind around. It would be as if, you know, every weekend in Premier League soccer, there was a horrific injury. Or every weekend in NASCAR racing or American football, there was a horrific injury or a death. Uh, that's what air racing was like in the 1920s. And, and sadly, uh, the all women's air race of 1929 uh, would have its own fatality. Uh, Marvel Crossan uh, was the woman's name, and, and, and she would not make it to the end. But if we were to compare that to, say, the Bendix, which is the, the men's big transcontinental race that would, would end at the air races, and that was the sort of the premier race, they would have far more fatalities than, than was on the, the women's race, wasn't it? So. Did it come down to just bad press that a woman died in an airplane in an air race as opposed to two or three guys dying in the Bendix, which was quite quite regular over the course of its of its life? Yeah. Yeah, I think what you're what you're suggesting is is that the women would receive, you know, criticism when when there was a death in their race in nineteen twenty nine. Mm, yes. And and they would many other times in the years to follow. In fact, every time a woman crashed in an air race and died or suffered a, a, a terrible injury, there would be reams of, of news ink uh, that was spilled uh, debating whether or not they should be allowed to fly given the, the obvious danger and their inability to do so. Uh, it was more sign of the misogyny of the day because, you know, as you said, almost every time the men took to the air in one of these major air races, there was a terrible crash. There was often a fatality. And when the men would die at the air races, as sadly they, they, they often did, um, they would be uh, venerated as heroes. Uh, 
At times, they would hold um, tributes to the men who had died right there on the airfield that very weekend with moments of silence and 21 gun salutes. Uh, and in one case, uh, a man's ashes, uh, a pilot's ashes, who had just flown a couple of days earlier, was, was scattered over the field while everyone held their hats over their hearts in silence. When a woman died in the air races, as sadly often happened, uh, none of that, none of that occurred. Uh, there were no moments of silence. There were no tributes to their heroism. There was instead questions, questions about could they do it, questions about were they strong enough, and and of course, uh, as you might imagine, um, those questions really rankled um, the the key protagonists of my story. You know, Louise Staden, Amelia Earhart, uh, Ruth Nichols. They were not going to tolerate those kind of questions. And really, you know, they would continue to fly and make bold and daring flights uh, as a way to answer their critics and to show that it could be done. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are with the Pima Air and Space Museum's Learjet Model 23. Model 23 was Learjet's first small business jet. This one was owned by the Timken family of uh, Ohio, the Timken ball bearings. They were a company that made well-known ball bearings for all different types of machinery. Louise Timken was the matriarch of the family and she was the first woman to get a jet pilot's license here in the United States for the Learjet. Um, she had gotten a license for a smaller uh, like four seat jet beforehand. Um, the zebra skin inside on the seats was from a zebra that she shot in safari back in the day. Um, they uh, flew this aircraft uh, for many years before, uh, or after they had moved out and retired out here to Arizona, they uh, finally at one point stopped flying the airplane and they donated it here to the Pima Air and Space Museum. Also on display in our Women in Flight exhibit is a red visor and red shoes that she always wore when she was flying this airplane. Um, over the years, Louise Simkin, you know, has gotten many awards for just, you know, being who she was, you know, in Ohio and here in Arizona. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Let's talk about some of those bold flights, because Louise Thaden does some incredible flying, doesn't she? She's, she sets records for time in the air, refueling in the air, all of those things that today you think of with military aircraft in their case there was people literally handing a hose down from one plane to another she's she's a remarkable remarkable woman let's talk about her for a bit because where did she come from because a lot like ruth elder as well it's it's what we would consider a normal background that she just wanted to fly and boy did she yeah louise stayed in uh you know like almost all of these people both the men and the women was not you know, uh, the child of a pilot. It was hard to be a child of a pilot if you were born in 1905. Um, she was um, uh, the, the daughter of a, of a traveling salesman, um, raised in Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, the, the modern day headquarters of the Walmart Corporation, which at the time was a very um, small and, and rural uh, community. Um, her family ultimately did move to Wichita uh, where her father's work took them, uh, at Wichita, Kansas. And, and, and um, you know, Louise uh, was expected by her parents to do um, what young women in the 1920s were, were told to do. She was expected to, um, um, to, to graduate from high school, perhaps, and then uh, marry and, and, and marry well. Um, but Louise, you know, always had a different vision for her life. Um, you know, she she wanted to choose her own path. And, you know, as a young girl, she had seen um, a barnstorming group of pilots fly into Bentonville and was absolutely enamored um, by the sight of the airplanes that day. 
And as a teenager in Wichita, um, she now had easy access um, to a, a pretty fascinating place um, out on the edge of Wichita in, in the 1920s uh, was, was Prairie Land. And uh, a man by the name of Walter Beach uh, had, had claimed some of that Prairie Land uh, to use as an airstrip and as a, a place to build uh, his planes, which at the time were called Travel Airs. And, and Louise would essentially, uh, after school or on weekends, uh, drift out um, to, to, this, to this airfield and hang around. And, and, and she must have been uh, a pretty obvious uh, sight out there. Louise was rather tall for the time. She was over five foot eight. Um, she had uh, dark hair and, and, and uh, icy blue eyes. And hanging around that field, she told uh, the guys working in Travel Air that she, she wanted to learn to fly planes. She wanted to work there. And uh, ultimately, she did just that. And as we were saying, she could set many, many feats. She wants to, to compete. But she's also quite different to Earhart. Earhart has this, this trajectory that is different from most of the other women here. But Louise ends up having a family as well. And almost has to be sort of coaxed back into it as she sort of hangs up her flying helmet for a while. She does do what is, is, is expected of her. But when she does come back, she's doing remarkable things, setting up navigation points and, and, and things like that, isn't she? She's doing many different aspects to it, not just coming back for the races. I, every time the page turned on her story, it was this incredibly driven woman making these very pragmatic decisions to still do what she wants to do, but also not at the, at the, the, the sort of threat to her family. Cause she had what, two, two young kids as well. Yeah. Yeah. She was really the rarest kind of uh, female flyer in these days because she wasn't um, just a woman who flew in race planes. Uh, she was a mother. Uh, that was incredibly rare. And, it, and, and I should be clear, it wasn't something that she felt, you know, that she had to do. It was what she wanted to do. I think Louise, to me, was a very modern kind of woman living in the 1920s and 30s. Um, you know, she, she wanted to have it all. You know, she wanted to have a husband and she wanted to have kids and she wanted to live that life. But she also wanted to, to, to live her own life uh, away from home. Uh, she wanted to fly. And so, you know, that did make her um, a very unusual um, uh, person for her time. I also, you know, I often think about, um, you know, what it would have been like for Louise in 1935 when she had a, a five-year-old boy and, and a three-year-old uh, girl um, to, to go to, say, the, uh, the PTO meeting at, at, at her son's kindergarten. I mean, Louise would have had absolutely nothing in common with the other mothers there. Um, but because she was a mother, uh, she did have this different perspective on, on the world, you know, and, and, and it, did, it did affect the way she flew. It did affect the choices she made. And, and it did, in fact, uh, uh, inform the advice that she gave her friend Amelia. You know, Louise had opportunities, too, to uh, fly across the ocean. Uh, and maybe be the first to do that. Um, you know, at the time in the early 1930s, uh, plane manufacturers would happily uh, recruit a woman uh, to put on a plane to fly across the ocean to prove that it could be done uh, and, and to get press for it. You know, by 1931, 32, 33, a man flying across the ocean uh, didn't generate much publicity, much of, if any, headlines. Uh, but when a, when a woman did it, it, it did. And so Louise did have opportunities to do that. And, and she turned them down. Uh, she did not want to fly across the ocean. You know, as she said at that time, you know, if something goes wrong, you know, in a single engine plane somewhere over the Atlantic or the Pacific, I mean, the chances of survival are low. Um, and so, you know, when, when Amelia would make these choices in 1932, to fly solo across the Atlantic. In 1935, to fly solo from Hawaii to Oakland, the first woman to fly that stretch of the Pacific Ocean. And of course, 1937 on this 
around the world flight. Louise didn't really approve, you know, and, and she told Amelia as much. I mean, one of the most powerful uh, letters or memos uh, or telegrams that I found during my research was written from uh, Louise to Amelia in the summer of 1935. Um, Amelia had just flown that leg of the Pacific Ocean in her, in her Lockheed Vega, uh, you know, from, from Hawaii to Oakland. And in doing so became the first woman to, to fly the Pacific there. And, and when she lands in Oakland, Amelia, 10,000 people have been waiting all night at the airfield uh, for her to arrive. And, and when her, her plane taxis over to the terminal area, it is swarmed by a crowd that is it's still uh, breathtaking to see in photographs. And, 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 and she receives accolades, Amelia does, from, from around the world. Uh, from the White House to London, every major uh, flyer, male and female, actors, actresses, everybody writes Amelia to tell her um, how proud they are of her, but not Louise. Um, that same week, um, Louise is, is home in Bentonville uh, with her two kids, um, and, and she writes uh, Amelia a letter uh, where she says, and I'm quoting here, she says, um, darn your hide. I could spank your pants. Someday you have to tell me why you do things like this. And, and, and Louise goes on in this very short letter to say to Amelia um, that she wishes that she would rest on her laurels. And then she very prophetically tells Amelia, you're worth more alive than dead. And that letter would come, of course, you know, two and a half years before you know, Amelia would make another bold and, and daring flight, you know, that round the world flight from which she would never return. And before she made that flight, uh, Louise had an opportunity to see Amelia in Burbank, California, where she was preparing her plane. And um, she wrote in her memoir about how they sat on the edge of her inflatable raft. And Louise told her that she wished she could talk her out of it. And in, in, in the story that Louise tells, Amelia said nothing. She just reached over with her hand and she grabbed Louise's and she squeezed it. Because the, these two, for the competitive nature of them, they, they essentially had unionized women flyers as well, hadn't they? They were working very hard to push forward the image of female aviation at the time. So the relationship they have is fantastic it's sort of competitive familiar but then also this professional drive as well to show what they're doing is as good as the men and therefore shouldn't be treated any differently absolutely yes i mean you know in addition to pushing for uh their their ability to fly in the air races uh in addition to them fighting the establishment again and again they do form uh, what is at the at the beginning anyway a fairly loose collection of female pilots that then forms into something much more established. Um, in November, you know, 1929, um, they met uh, a handful of them did on Long Island in New York, and and they decided to to form this this group essentially uh, an advocacy group or or a union of of, of female pilots. And they sent out uh, invites to every licensed female pilot in America at that time. It was about 125. And they received uh, replies, positive replies, from 99 of them. And so they decided to call their, their group the 99s. Um, and, and, and over the course of the rest of you know, my narrative in Fly Girls, you know, from 1929 to 1936, the 99s is constantly you know, advocating um, for, for women's rights in the sky. Um, and, and that group uh, is still around today. The 99s um, still exist today um, and, and with the same mission, uh, though, of course, with uh, far more than just 99 members. And I've had some very, very famous presidents since. Jackie Cochran was president of the 99s as well, wasn't she? So it's, it's been something um, Absolutely. And it's amazing, amazing that it's still going um, and doing the work that they're doing. Now, just to start to tidy things up, because we can't leave the Bendix there without talking about the race that Louise won, because that was huge. But 
again, she was hesitant to go into it. And another woman presented her with the tool that she couldn't refuse, could she? Because this is where the wonderful Olivan Beach enters your, your tale as well, doesn't she? Because she sort of whips Walter into shape and then turns her eyes on the, the biggest prize in, in flying. Absolutely. So by 1936... Uh, Everyone in my narrative has traveled uh, a difficult journey. Um, there have been multiple deaths along the way of, of the women. As a result of, of one of those deaths in particular, uh, for two years time, the women were banned from racing, a ban that they fought um, tooth and nail. Um, Louise is now you know, in the thralls of, of raising two children um, while her husband uh, Herb Thaden is is struggling to make a living building planes, uh, and and you know while all this is happening, uh, you know Walter Beach back in in Wichita, the man who had once owned uh, and operated and founded Travel Air on the edge of the prairie, uh, has sold the company uh, in in the in the in the depths of the depression, uh, and 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 gone to work briefly for a different airplane manufacturer in New York City. He leaves Wichita, moves to New York, and he hates it there. Um, and, you know, he is advised um, by a woman who had once been his secretary that perhaps uh, they should go home, go back to Wichita. And that woman is uh, Olive Ann Beach, uh, Olive Ann Meller, uh, as her maiden name was. Uh, she was uh, Walter's secretary. You know, they they uh, they meet at Travel Air. Um, their their relationship is very rocky at first. Uh, you know, Walter was very much a man of his era, um, and and didn't uh, give Olive Ann at least initially the, the respect that she deserved. Um, but quickly realized that they had a lot in common and could actually complement each other in many ways. Olive Ann not afraid of fi- flying. You know, Walter took her up in his planes and did flips and turns and all sorts of things. He, he didn't scare her. Um, and, and Olive was incredibly bright and educated, as opposed to Walter, who had uh, dropped out of school um, as a boy in Tennessee and was really um, just a pilot who knew how to build planes and knew how to build them well. And so together they they could do something different. And they go back to Wichita in the early 1930s, 32, 33, 34, um, and back on the edge of that prairie, um, begin to build a new plane um, that that Walter calls the Beechcraft. Um, and and he has just a couple, you know, goals in mind for the Beechcraft. He wants them to be safer. He wants them to be reliable. Um, so that they can be flown by nearly anyone, but he wants them to be fast. And, and so those are the three things he's looking for, safety, reliability, and speed. And, and, you know, it's the depression still, 32, 33, 34, 35. Plane sales are, as you might imagine, rather slow. Um, some years they're, they have as many as one plane sold, then 18, then a little bit more. I mean, they are barely hanging on there in Wichita. And, you know, in 1936, uh, with the women now cleared to fly in the Bendix race, once again, with the women now allowed to compete in the air races, once again, uh, a handful of women decide to enter. Uh, Amelia Earhart is going to fly. She's going to fly transcontinental from New York to Los Angeles, where the air races are going to be held that year. Um, And and Olivan tells... Uh, Walter, that they should have someone fly their newest Beechcraft, uh, their so-called Stagger Wing Beechcraft, uh, as a way to um, prove that it's reliable and safe and fast. Um, and, and, and Olive suggests that a woman should do it. And, and when she says that, she already knows who she has in mind. Um, she wants to call Louise Thaden in and, and, and Arkansas and, and see if she'd be willing to do it. And, dear listener, you'll have to read the book to hear about that, that tale, right? <laughs> So we're just going to tease it, because it, it is fantastic, because that 36 race is rem- remarkable for it, because we had um, John Lancaster on a, a few months ago talking about the 1919 transcontinental uh, race, 
as well. And to think that in, what was that, 15, 16 years, suddenly it's part of a wider air race and it's not really considered a huge thing that people were going to be flying across the continent to win a trophy. It had gone from this unthinkable thing in under two decades to being this exciting thing when they're going for a trophy and a cash prize, really, as opposed to whatever it was they were doing in the time before. Oh, it's fantastic. But you're, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, by 36, 37, this once um, unthinkable thing is now um, just like any other sport. It's of course they're going to race. Um, and, and, you know, unbeknownst to, to, to everybody, the pilots, the organizers, Cliff Henderson, um, the planners of the air races, everybody, it is really the waning days of the golden age of air racing, you know, at that, in that very moment. I mean, with, with the, with the dawn of the war that is coming, all of those pilots are going to go, you know, off to fight. And, and, and when, and when they return, after the war is over, um, air racing is never really what it had been in that little window of time in the 1920s and 30s. The book's been out for about five years now, and you, you've done more, and I'm going to pick your brain about your new one, which I'm really excited about. Non-aviation, I'm afraid, people, but we'll come back to that. It's clearly got a place in your heart, because when I mentioned to you on Twitter, would you be happy? It was almost an instantaneous thing. I'm always happy to chat about Fly Girls. How has it stayed with you since you you wrote it? How has how has it, how has it affected you over over the years since? Because you know clearly clearly you still have a passion for this tale. I mean, it, personally, it's a, it's affected me in in so many ways, um, and in ways I I never really imagined when I started. You know, when that that bolt of lightning hit me with the original idea back in 2016. For starters, you know. It never occurred to me, even when I was writing the book, that so many female pilots would come to my book events or want to hear the story or want to come out or read it and have something to say about it or read it and identify with someone. That It just, it just didn't occur to me, Matt. And, and I've met every kind of pilot. I mean, I've met female pilots from age nine to age 93. You know, I've met, you know, uh, women's air service pilots, the, the, the former wasps to, to the youngest pilots, um, you know, coming up today. And it, that's been really powerful. I, I, never, I never really thought about that. That's one. Two, you know, every time, every time I'm in a plane, I think about them. You know, they risked so much at a time when they weren't receiving the respect for doing so. And so, you know, when I'm in a plane like all of us are today and we're barreling down that runway or we're bursting through the clouds or we're at 30,000 feet and, and looking down at the earth below, you know, I think Complaining about, about the lack of legroom. Yeah. <laughs> right. Complain about the lack of leg room or, or the, you know, the, the, the fact that the television doesn't work and the seat back in front of me, whatever, all these little minor complaints. I think about how far we've come and all of the people who, who made that possible. You know, it, it's, it's a thought that just drifts through my mind. Or I think about Louise or I think about Amelia. Um, and then, you know, I made some personal con connections along the way, you know, as we've discussed, um, a lot of these women didn't marry or, or didn't have children. You know, Amelia is, is, is an example of that. You know, she married, but had no children. Um, and Louise was this rare sort of uh, protagonist, this rare sort of person who did. And so one of the very first things I did when I realized, okay, I, I'm going to tell this story. I'm going to try to write this book is I, I tried to find uh, Louise's children. And um, you know, her son, uh, William Faden, was born in, in 1930, um, and her, her daughter, Patricia, was born in 1933. And I started first by looking for, for, for uh, Bill Faden, uh, because it's usually easier for a journalist to find uh, a man because he, he likely hasn't changed his last name. And uh, I was sad, just devastated. Um, to, to, to learn that just a few years before I began my research, 
um, uh, Bill had died. Um, but even more devastating, Matt, he lived no more than 20 minutes from me here in New Hampshire. Oh, no. Oh, and dear. it was just like, it felt like this just cosmic, you know, gut punch. I just couldn't believe that this story all these years has been sitting here and this man was right here, you know, 20 minutes mm -hmm. away from me. Um, and so I thought, oh, gosh, what, what bad luck. You know, maybe this, is, maybe this isn't going to happen. And then, and then I did look for her daughter. And her daughter had married a couple times over the years. And so her name had changed a couple times. Um, but I did ultimately find her. And she was uh, still alive. And she was living uh, in suburban Maryland outside of Baltimore. And, and I called her and, and spoke to her on the phone and then ultimately spent many days at Pat's house in Maryland. And, you know, uh, you know, fortunately, you know, uh, Pat lived long enough to see the book come out. Um, you know, unfortunately she, she is no longer with us now. Um, Pat died in early 2021 of complications of COVID, um, uh, before oh, the yeah. vaccine was available. Yeah. Um, but you know, Pat and I became very close, you know, she was, uh, I never met her mother, of course, right? You know, Louise dies in the 1970s. Um, but Pat was very much like her. Um, you know, just like, uh, just like Louise, Pat was tall and, 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 and slender. Um, just like Louise, she had this very sort of, sort of folksy way of speaking and this uh, certain warmth to her. And I really do believe, and I, and I say this, you know, in, in, in the acknowledgments in the book, when you sat with um, Pat, you did uh, feel the presence of her mother. And you really did feel that connection to this, to, this, to this moment in time, this moment that's now almost 100 years ago. And so for all of those reasons, um, yeah, this, this book and this story uh, will always be important to me. So how does that compare to writing about Pete Rose? <laughs> So, dear listener, we're going to segue from aviation onto baseball for a minute, because when I was growing up in, in Canada, there were a few names in sport that were bigger than Pete Rose. He was Mr. Baseball when I was a kid, and yeah, I was in Toronto, so we never got to see him, because before interleague play, ladies and gentlemen, right. I'm sure in my age. The new book, Charlie Hustle, it looks fantastic. You're well into the edits at the moment. I'm going to actually try to phrase this like this. When you're writing about a sportsman as successful and controversial as Pete Rose, do you find yourself thinking back to the opportunities maybe that he had coming up that your fly girls tried to have in the 30s in, in their sport? Because the talent on both sides was there. But as a guy, and as supremely talented as Pete was, that quirk of genetics meant that he had those opportunities that the girls had to fight so hard for. Yeah, I do think about that. And I think, you know, the, the, the one, the one common thread, Matt, in all my books, whether it's about, you know, female pilots in the 1920s and thirties or, or about Pete Rose or about something else is finding the humanity in the story you know, um, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, that's what people want to read. You know, we want to read stories that are human um, for good and for ill. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Pete's is, at least the way I'm, I'm approaching it, is, is a very human story. I mean, as I, as I see him, he was he was Icarus in stirrup socks and cleats. You know, he was mm -hmm. this man who, who came from a working class, a white working class family on the West side of Cincinnati, uh, which was I itself a, a working class area, uh, who never was as a young man, not in uh, little league, not in high school, not even in the minors. Uh, at least his first year in the minors, was never considered uh, the best player on his teams. He had no obvious athleticism, uh, no obvious skill, 
uh, which is why he was overlooked many times. Um, and then like squeezed um, every ounce of talent out of his body um, and, and utilized every opportunity that was available to him. Um, I, a lot of lucky breaks in his early years um, to, to become uh, you know, one of the most prolific hitters in baseball history, the all-time hit king, and and you know, objectively speaking, one of the one of the best hitters in major league history. It it defies it defies reason. I I I you know I describe him at one point in the book as the you know he's the most ordinary, extraordinary athlete of the 20th century here in America, um, and yet. You know, for all of those qualities, um, you know, he cannot stay out of his own way off the field um, and and ultimately gets himself in trouble with gambling and gambling on baseball, gambling on his own team, breaking the rules of baseball um, uh, for the same reasons why he succeeded on it. You know, he fails off of it for the reasons why he succeeded on it, which is he refuses to uh, to give anyone um, any any window of opportunity. He refuses to be weak. Um, he's going to win. And ultimately, that's why he doesn't in the end. And I think that is just a very compelling human narrative. I'm really excited to read about that because I, I can remember the, the whole stuff happening in 89 when everything came crashing down around him and I, I, I have memories of the press conference as well because you know we had season tickets at the jays and things and it was all anyone was talking about in the stands and yeah you've got a lot of time at baseball to talk about lots of things when you <laughs> that's why i love going to the cricket here because you just chat with your friends for four or five hours it's fun you're right you're right i mean you're absolutely right i mean if you were if you were alive in August 1989 uh, and a baseball fan, uh, you know exactly where you were on the morning of those press conferences. I mean, in the baseball world and frankly, uh, in America, you know, life stopped for that hour and 20 minutes and everybody was watching the TV because something was happening that you thought would never happen, which was Pete Rose was being banned from baseball for life. Hmm. It, it was it, oh, it was the most extraordinary year because I it sticks in my mind for that the Jays won the pennant got beat by the A's and then it was the earthquake in the World Series as well in in the in the Battle of the Bays it it was just an epic year and of course an epic book which will be out soon when when, when is it when when is it due to land Keith yeah sure thank you uh, it, the book is called Charlie Hustle and it it is coming out in March of twenty four so. Um... March of 24, but pre-orders are available now. Mm. Never too early to pre-order, Matt. Never too I, early. I, sh I shall put links to both books in the description <laughs> for this for this pod because, like I said, I'm 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 really excited by it. Thank and you. Yes, my, my googling and research for for this chat did get sidetracked once or twice to watching old YouTube clips of, of Pete <laughs> and that press conference as well. Goodness, yeah. Keith, this has been fantastic. Thank, thank you so much for the book because I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've recommended it to, to loads of people. And of course, now hopefully a whole pile more will, will read it as well. So thank you so much for spending some time with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was my pleasure. I cannot thank Keith enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. Fly Girls is a fantastic book. I whizzed through it in a few sittings. There are loads of post-it notes and things in it with my scribbles. And an hour is not really long enough to delve into some of the things that Keith has found in the stories that he's told of this remarkable group of women. So you need to buy the book, links for which are in the description below, and I hope you didn't mind the baseball segue because I am here in England. They don't do baseball, and I'm in the wrong time zone for watching the Jays. Mind you, that's not always a bad thing, but that's for another podcast. Like I said, the links are all in the description below, including for Charlie Hustle, which is out in March. Looks fantastic. Keith keeps teasing it on his Twitter feed, and I'm really excited to get my hands on it. Thank you always for your continued support of the podcast. Like, subscribe, 
put your stars into your podcast app of choice. It all helps the algorithms. Things have been ticking along nicely. And as always, I have to thank our incredible sponsors at the Pima Air and Space Museum, who will be continuing as our partner for the podcast for the next little while as well, which is great, which means we're heading back out there in the spring. If you'd like to become a damn castier on Patreon, that starts from just three pounds a month plus the VAT, you now get stickers, which are our logo and a specific one for being a damn castier. You can only get those if you bump into me and I happen to have them in my pocket or you become a damn castier. Three pounds a month plus a bit of that, but we know times are tough, so just share the pod. You've all been wonderful and the support is really humbling that this silly little thing of me sitting in a room chatting to people about airplanes is finding an audience. So thank you for being my audience. Thank you for joining Keith and I this week. Next week and the week after, I'm sorry, but we're going back to World War II. It's going to be Blenheim's and the 9th Troop Carrier Command with James Jeffries and Adam Berry. Not at the same time. That's just the next two episodes. As always, thank you for your support. Once again, I'm going to keep hammering that home. Please do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.